Well, good morning. We're looking at Psalm 119. If you're studying online with us or by conference call, go ahead and turn your Bible there. If you can see the screen, you'll be able to follow along. But if not, don't worry. You'll be able to see uh, what we're doing. Looking at the gold mine of the Old Testament. That's what we're calling this uh, psalm. Uh, just one psalm, just one. We think of chapters, but it's not really a chapter. Each of the psalms in the psalm is just that. It's an individual psalm or song. And this one is 176 verses in length, longer uh, than a great many of both the Old and the New Testament books. And so just one psalm. Uh, here is the Hebrew alphabet, and I know you can't see that very well even if you're here uh, with us in the auditorium, but that just shows you a little bit about the development uh, of the Hebrew alphabet. Now you may say, well, what difference does the Hebrew alphabet make? In this psalm, it is an acrostic. That is, the first eight verses all begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. And uh, someone asked, does that mean that you would say that word like an A, Aleph, like a long A, so, so to speak? And really it's interesting in the Hebrew, uh, that particular word is meant to just serve as kind of a breathing pause. And the way that I was uh, taught how this would be understood by an English speaker, uh, if we put the English words together, at, A-T, and then the English word all, A-L-L, -L, if we were just reading those words off the page, we would be tempted to read it very quickly and say, I'm not hungry at all, at all. And we make it kind of one word. Uh, what the Hebrew language would do, they would put that olive in between those two words so that you would have to pause and say, I'm not hungry at all. And that, that kind of exhale is what that letter olive actually represents. There's no A sound in Hebrew particularly. So it'd be quite difficult even to say my name. Uh, but there is a B, and that is verses 9 uh, to 16. 22 sections in this psalm, eight verses each. And so Aleph, and then the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the Hebrew letter Beth. And it looks like Beth, like our sister Beth, Bell, but actually it's not Beth, it's Beth. And you have to kind of put a th on the, on the H. Here's where my sore tongue actually comes in handy this morning. Uh, Hebrew is read right to left, not left to right. And uh, so if you can see there, I'll use my little pointer for those in the auditorium. All of these are Beth down through here. That's verse 1, right to left. That's verse 2, right to left. And on down the line, that's Psalm 119 uh, written in Hebrew. Now, interestingly, and I wish I could have showed you this last week with Aleph. Maybe if you look there in your Bible, uh, mine actually has the Hebrew letter. It says Aleph right there, and then it has the Hebrew character, the Hebrew letter. Hebrew was also first a um, kind of a picture symbolic language. And... Uh, this is still true for certain languages today. For instance, Mandarin, Chinese, is a picture symbol language. They don't have letters. They write out characters that represent some sort, as we would think of, an image. And here, uh, the B, or the V, and I'll explain that in a moment, the Beth, actually looks like uh, that on there on the left side, the yellow. What does that look like? Anybody want to venture a guess to see if you're right? What's the yellow Beth look like as it was originally first written way back when? A tent or a house. And so the letter Beth in Hebrew represents a house or a tent. Now, you may say, what difference does that make? Well, especially when you come to the New Testament, you'll begin to see this. Jesus was born where? Beth Lehem. Lehem is the Hebrew word for bread. Jesus was born in the town known as the house of bread. We say Bethlehem. They'd say Bethlehem. Uh, Lehem is the house of bread. So that word originally meant house. Uh, the olive there, if you look in your Bible and you actually see the character, is the word that they would say represents the ox or strength. Uh, and uh, you may see that, you may not, the head of an ox in the word olive. Well, uh, Hebrew doesn't use uh, in we think of uh, consonants and vowels, A, E, I, O, U sometimes. Why? Those are our vowels that help us form words. They don't use vowels in their language. And so to overcome that, they use little... Uh, remember when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, not even the smallest jot or tittle would evaporate from the law or would be uh, you know, unfulfilled except by His will. And those little jots and tittles... Uh, not only describe pronunciation, but help us insert vowel sounds uh, so that we can understand it. Well, 
with the word Beth, or the letter Beth, excuse me, uh, there is that little dot that you see in the middle. And if you see that, like you saw on the previous screen, then it would be pronounced with a B, that sort of sound. However, if you just write the letter Beth without that little dot in the middle, this is really technical, isn't it? You would pronounce it like a V. And then, for instance, we see in our Bibles when we read the name Abraham, A-B is the way you would begin Abraham's name. Actually, when we think about A-B and we say Abraham, they wouldn't pronounce it that way. The Hebrew a way to say Abraham's name is to say Avraham, Avra, because the Beth in his name does not have the little dot in the middle, and so it's pronounced more like a V than a B. So Avraham is the way they would say instead of Abraham. Well, that's enough maybe about Beth, but all verses 9 to 16 begin with that letter Beth. And so even though we don't see it in our English translations, uh, it's a, be a beautiful testimony to the composition of this particular psalm. Whoever may have written it originally, we don't know. Many people suggest David. I told you that it may have been Ezra, the scribe, who came back from Babylonian captivity, uh, along with Nehemiah, helped restore and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Um, there is one relatively newer uh, idea, suggestion, and it's not really caught on in what we call scholarly literature, uh, but I admit it's quite, um, it's quite interesting to propose uh, a gentleman um, who studied this. He said that it reads to him uh, as if it were the work of one of these captives that were taken from Jerusalem and Judea into Babylonian captivity, and maybe he's just writing it as they walk on that exile. Uh, maybe this is just a way for him to remember uh, God's word. Is that a possibility? I, I suppose that it is because uh, the Bible doesn't give us any definitive uh, Holy Spirit inspired information about who wrote it and when and where and how. Uh, we're left to only speculate, but regardless, we know it to be God's word about God's word, and this one, whoever he may have been who was writing it, certainly had a great appreciation for Scripture. So let's read uh, these verses together. Please uh, follow along with me. This is the New King James Version rendering. Psalm 119, verses 9 to 16. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. <clears throat> we said... Uh, when we did the introductory lesson, I guess a couple of weeks ago, it's hard really to pinpoint any certain theme in the psalm. Even though these eight verse sections with each Hebrew letter do constitute an arrangement, when you get into the actual text itself, it's hard really to say what's his main point. Or is he following some sort of outline? Is he developing a theme? And really it's hard to say really that he is. However, uh, there will be oftentimes something that seems to maybe emerge. And in this section, maybe the very first verse, verse 9, gives us what we should ask uh, as for a theme. How can a young man, how can a young person, it's not including, of course, females, cleanse his ways? I'm just summarizing it this way. How can youth live clean lives? Now, announcing that question, some of you may say, well, I can just forget about this. I'll go to sleep till he tells me it's time to worship. Don't do that even though you may not describe yourself by that word, youth, any longer. It's still something that we all need to study regardless of our age. No matter how many birthdays you've had, here's the way that you need to live. Now, I think the emphasis is going to be that we should start this when we're young, but we should all be concerned with living a clean life. What is a clean life? If you look that up on your uh, computer or phone, just put it into your favorite search engine, that be Google or something else, you'll have a wide variety of ideas presented to you. Some people will say, well, a clean life. Oh, yes, I know what that's all about. That's about eating organic food, right? And what's organic food? It's just they put a sticker uh, on the apple and charge twice as much, right? That's, I, I know there's some serious, maybe I hope the USDA is actually inspecting those things. That means 
They've not put any pesticides, any bad chemicals. Supposedly organic is the way, you know, everybody grew up eating a long time ago before we started mass producing food. But they would say, eat organic. That's a clean way to live. Or, you know, um, you could even uh, go to the detergent aisle and you can get this sort of uh, laundry detergent for whatever, five bucks a bottle. But if you want it to not have all these other chemicals, you can pay three times as much. Does the same thing, just how much money you want to part with them. Okay, I'm, I'm being facetious here, but hopefully some of you have run into that. Is that a clean life? Well, I guess as it relates to pesticides and chemicals and things like that, uh, there may be some benefit uh, in doing that. Uh, my forebears, and many of you uh, know what I'm talking about here, their idea of living a clean life was eating uh, lard and, you know, uh, bacon every morning and doing some of that sort of thing and just getting uh, the garden vegetables in and it didn't hurt them any. So maybe we could go back to that. That's not the clean life we're talking about. We're talking about the clean life that was described in verses 1 to 8 as it related to obedience to God. Happiness comes from obedience to God. That's how you're happy. Now the world would say, you crazy preacher, you mean to tell me that I can have happiness in my life just by doing what that old book says about this God that you say you serve. That's absolutely what I'm saying. Don't try it until you knock it is maybe what we should tell people. And all of us, hopefully, who have tried it, have found it actually to be the case. It's never failed that if I serve God and obey Him in the way that He has prescribed, that I will not be happy. Now, that doesn't mean my life will not be filled with any sorrow it doesn't mean that I'll never have difficulty. It doesn't mean that there'll be hard times. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean I can have an abiding joy. I can have contentment. I can have peace. I can have satisfaction. Those things that no earthly good can possibly provide. Uh, what does living a clean life mean? Well, uh, obedience, what does it produce? What is it intended to produce? Uh, there's a big word that we use sometimes called sanctification. Or we might say holiness. That is, that my life is becoming more and more of what God would have it to be. And I think that's what here the psalmist is asking us to consider. And he's, of course, addressing it within the framework of even how we do that when we are young. God is holy and we must be the same. Uh, that is repeated in both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, that's what God told the people when he brought them out under the leadership of Moses. He said, I'll be your God, you can be my people if, that's conditional, you keep my covenant if you abide by my precepts, so on and so forth. Read, uh, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy to see that proof. And uh, Leviticus especially even has very detailed instructions about how they were to be holy. In the New Testament, that's repeated. Uh, Peter even tells us, quoting from the Old Testament, God said, be holy for I am holy, so that's my job. I'm to be set apart. Uh, for God, being like God, and uh, sanctification is that process, and it is a progression. It is developing in holiness and godliness. Now, hopefully all of us have seen that at work in our lives. Hopefully all of us have even been able to see that. Uh, it's hard to measure sometimes, but I hope uh, even maybe at the beginning of each new year, that would be a good time maybe to stop and take inventory and say, okay, what did I do last year? that I shouldn't have done, or what did I do that maybe this year I can do better? How can I improve? Uh, and that's important. Businesses do that. Uh, organizations do that. And uh, certainly God's people in their relationship with Him should evaluate and seek to do that. So I want to grow. I want to progress in holiness. That's the word sanctification. Here uh, in Psalm 119, asking the question, I think, is stating the obvious that's stated elsewhere. This quest, this journey, this pursuit to be more holy should begin when we're young. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1 says, Remember now your Creator when? In the days of your youth. And you remember what he follows that up with? Before the difficult days come. The older you get, the more difficult days become. Is that right? Some of you are laughing, kind of chuckling, nodding your head. That's true. If you're watching online or listening, you're nodding your head. Yeah. Um, and it happens to all of us. And now I'm the one saying it. I remember people saying, just wait. Now, guess what I'm saying? Just wait. You won't be able to run up and down the basketball court like you once did. Uh, now, there's some of them I still put to shame because I try to stay in pretty good shape. And I make fun of them as I run. I can't run as fast, but I can run longer. 
Uh, you see, I've got some stamina, so I was doing that. But I'm telling them, just wait. This is hard. I'm, uh, it, this hurts or whatever. Just wait, right? Some of you, of course, that are my senior are telling me, just wait. You think you can do it now? Uh, you can't. Uh, the body, and that's what that chapter is about, begins to break down. There's other problems uh, that come to us. So when should I serve God? When is it going to be easiest to serve God? When I'm young, in my youth. How do we live then a life of godliness and purity? How do we live a clean life? How do we live a righteous life? How do we live holy lives? How do we live lives that God will be pleased with? Well, that's what this eight verse section, the Beth section of Psalm 119 is all about. The answers are in verses 9 to 16. Now I put there 10 ways plus or minus. And the reason why I said that, some of you... Uh, we're probably privileged to get to hear Brother Wendell Winkler during his life. Uh, he passed away, I think, in 2005, six in that area. His son, Dan, I know Dan's been here for gospel meetings and stuff, but uh, Brother Wendell was, uh, of course, his father, masterful preacher. And every time you'd hear him speak, and some of these are actually still online, uh, he went through a lesson on this, and I was listening to it, and he said, we've got 10 ways how to live a clean life. Guess what? He preached for 45 minutes, and he got down to the end. He said, looked up at the clock, and he said, well, I've got through one and a half. You'll just have to take my word on the other eight and a half of them and uh, kind of ended the lesson. I'm not going to do that for you this morning, but maybe you can find 10 particular ways that a young person can live a clean life. I'm not going to number them one to 10, but let's just go through them. Here, if you're interested, uh, I like to mark in my study Bible, especially not my preaching Bible, so I don't get distracted. But if you write in your Bibles or something, if you just kind of outline this section, here's a good way I would uh, think to outline it. In this section, how can a young person, a young man, a young woman, no matter if they're 9 or 99, how can they live clean lives? The mandate is holiness. The means is God's word. The manner is submission or obedience to his word, however you wish to say. So there's a mandate, there's a means, and there's a manner. And God provides them each here in this section for us. Why do we start in youth? Well, there's a good reason. We said in Ecclesiastes 12 that that chapter says life gets harder. The longer you live, there's more challenges uh, there are more difficulties, that's true, but there's another reason. Genesis 8, verse 21, God makes an interesting statement, and it's God speaking, as it were. We don't even know if Noah was able to hear him, but they come out of the ark, and God makes a promise. God makes a promise, and he's going to, in chapter 9, say, I'll never destroy the earth again by water. I'll never take this sort of... I hate to say rash, I don't think God was rash, maybe drastic, that's the word to say. I will not make this drastic judgment on mankind again. But when Noah builds that ark and God accepts that uh, offering on that altar, the Bible says in verse 21, The Lord smelled a soothing aroma, and the Lord said in his heart, in his mind, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although, listen to this statement please, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Now, there are those who, following in the footsteps of Calvin, would say, See, that tells us that we're born sinners. No, that does not tell us we are born sinners. You cannot support that doctrine, the total depravity of humanity. That is, that individuals are born in sin, separate and apart from their rational choice or decision-making. The Bible does not support that. We don't have time to explore fully, but that's not what that verse is about. But it is about the reality that there is a preponderance, it seems, uh, for most of us when we have the choice to choose between good and evil, we choose evil, we choose sin, we choose selfishly, and that happens in youth. And uh, maybe today we could, if we again took the time, highlight uh, some of the examples of crime and other atrocious deeds that are done even increasingly by young people. Uh, that's just surprising to me. Now, that's a lack of certainly parental discipline and proper training and a lot of other things uh, factor in, but we're evil from youth in the sense of that there is a danger that is there. there. It is the case, and all of us can, I think, identify with this, some lusts are stronger in or for youth. Some lust are like that, and lust is just that generic word that means evil desires. And so Paul tells Timothy, flee, and that word flee means get away from, run as far away as you can, as fast as you can, youthful lust. There are things that are more maybe uh, appealing in one way, more tempting, more alluring in our youth, uh, maybe uh, there's a variety of factors, maybe some of those are just physiological in nature. 
Maybe some of them are due to ignorance. Um, you know, there's uh, certainly things that are done by young people that older people kind of look at and say, how could they be so foolish? You know, uh, seeing where that leads. Or maybe you even by personal experience, you did the same thing. And now that you're older, you look at them and say, how can they be so foolish without realizing you did the same thing? And you have to learn, as we say the hard way, some lessons. But some lust are stronger in youth. So for those of us that are parents, and if you're a grandparent, if you're an uncle or an aunt, or if you're anyone that can influence a young person with kindness and wisdom, just say, be careful there. You need to stay away from that. That's dangerous. Don't do that. That won't lead you where you want to go. And again, the ways in which that would be applicable are so very many. Habits, patterns, and ruts, when are they formed? Well, in youth. Um, Adrian could speak to this more than I can. He's certainly had more um, training in developmental psychology. I've had a little bit of it. And uh, there are studies that, uh, again, go across the spectrum on uh, these particular issues, but uh, it's widely believed by those who have studied uh, such matters that, you know, your personality is formed well before you're 20 years old, and most people would say even long before that. Now, certain personality traits, uh, certain uh, then routines and habits uh, that you form when you're young, uh, they're very difficult to overcome. That's not to say they cannot be changed. Uh, there is the excuse uh, today by many you know, that's the way I was raised. Or my daddy and mama, they were, you can fill in the blank. They abused drugs or alcohol, so I don't have any choice. I have to abuse drugs and alcohol. No, you don't. You have a choice. Well, my daddy, he chased women all the time, so I can't help it. That's just the way I am. I can't live a faithful life uh, to my wife. Yes, you can. You make decisions yourself. And uh, yet, it is true, even with those things being said, that habits formed in youth oftentimes carry on. They can be changed, but it's often very difficult. So then it's very important that good habits are formed even when we are young. So how do we do that? That's kind of a, a long introduction, if you will, but uh, this psalm will tell us. God's word is our only safe guide. How can a young man cleanse his way? Take heed according to your word. Do that with a whole heart. Notice verse 10, with my whole heart, I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. I ran across this uh, a couple of years ago, and I wrote an article on the blog uh, group that I was writing for at that time um, about the dangers of a divided heart. I'd really never noticed that, but uh, I'd invite you to take your concordance, whether paper copy or on your computer, and look up that word united or that word divided. Especially in the book of Psalms, you will often find uh, one of those two words used in connection with the heart. And it's not talking about this heart in your chest, but the one between your ears, a united or a divided heart. And the New Testament carries that over somewhat as well. Uh, James chapter 1, James says, do not be double-minded. That's the idea, a divided heart or a united heart. That is, I have to set my uh, you know, decision-making, my will fully on doing the will of God. And that's what the psalmist said he would do. That's what young people should do. With my whole heart, I have sought you. Psalm 27, 4, Psalm 86, 11. That's just a couple of references among others that you could see to prove that. We should fear, as the psalmist said in verse 10, oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Wonder. You know, we are uh, told today, you know, that life's a journey. So just enjoy it. Just go whatever direction you want to go. Uh, fly by the seat of your pants, so to speak. We should fear wandering from God. God has given us, as it were in His Word, a road map. We are not wanderers in the sense of we don't know where we're going. We know where we're going. Christians do. We know how to get there. But we have to take the map of His Word to get there, to follow it. And so we should fear wandering from God. Even though we are not wanderers, He's given us His Word to give us direction in our lives. Verse 11 may be the theme, as it were, of the section, maybe even of the entire psalm. All 176 verses might be uh, the psalmist's uh, attempt to do just what verse 11 instructs us to do. What's that? Your word. He's, of course, speaking to God. So your word, God, I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Yeah, that's wonderful, isn't it? Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word should be hidden. Now, that word hidden, we think of concealing. 
If I hide it, when I play hide and seek, I don't want my buddies to find me. I'm going to conceal it. If you buy a gift and don't want uh, you know, your spouse or children, you're going to put it out of view. Uh, the word here for hidden doesn't really relate to concealment as much as it means to store something. It actually, better translated, and some versions actually do this, uh, with an ancient idea to treasure up. To treasure. That is, I'm going to maybe hide it away because it's valuable. Jesus said uh, in the New Testament in Luke chapter thir- or Matthew chapter 13, That if a man finds a treasure in a field, what would he do? He'd hide it again and then go and sell everything he had so that he could buy the field, right? Because there's treasure. It's treasured up. It's something that's going to be protected. I was uh, hearing someone yesterday and they were asking some things about what happens after death, about wills and probate and stuff like that. And uh, this individual had passed away and didn't have uh, any children, but they had hidden some money in a freezer in the house. And then they'd given the house to someone else. And then other family members were trying to argue whose money it was. You know, they had hidden their money in the freezer. Well, there's a better way to do it. I guess uh, you should put it in the bank and some sort of maybe uh, account like that. But this is the idea that I treasure it, that I put it away out of sight. Not so that I don't show it to others or that I don't live by it, but that it's there because it's valuable, because it's treasured. Now, how do I treasure? How do I hide God's word in my heart, in my mind? I know of no other way other than by reading and by studying. Being together at times like this when we can discuss it and where instruction can be received concerning it. You know, that's just so important. And so he said, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. What a task. The word in the heart of the mind is the best preventative against sin. People say, well, you know, I'd like to serve God, but, you know, I just struggle with sin. How do I get over that? Some people say we've got to be tough. You've got to have a stronger willpower. That might be part of it. But you also have to put God's word in your heart. And that should motivate you then to hate other things more. Uh, Our family heard Brother Glenn Colley Tuesday night at Willow Avenue. And he said, there's not enough Christians that hate what's wrong uh, in, in relation to sin enough. And he said, they love other things more. They might hate whatever, a certain sin, but they don't hate it enough. And I think that's a good point. Putting God's word in my heart helps me hate sin more because I realize what sin is. Now, what is sin? It's really a word that we don't often define. First John 3 verse 4 says it's transgression of the law. And it is. I think you could look at it as spiritual, cosmic treason against the king of the universe. That's what it is. We understand treason maybe against our nation, breaking its law to help the enemy. That's what I do when I disobey God uh, to help the enemy, uh, the devil, as it were. One of the best definitions, and I don't know who to give credit for and where I really remember first hearing it, but sin is, and this is the simple definition for you this morning, breaking the heart of God. Think about that. If you've had a broken heart, and probably all of us have at some point in life due to some circumstance, you know what that's like to have a broken heart. Sin is breaking the heart of God. It's taking His love that He offers and disregarding it ignoring it, or maybe even worse, uh, you know, just violating it in some way. Sin is breaking the heart of God, so I don't want to be guilty of that. I need to put God's word in my heart. Psalm 51, verse 6, David understood after his sin with the Bathsheba, he said, you desire truth in the inmost being. That's where it has to start. Yes, David sinned outwardly, but it was because he didn't have enough of God's word in his heart. Luke 8, 4 to 15, Jesus said, the sower sows. And the seed as it grows, the Word of God finds different soil. We need to have good hearts where it will grow well. Jeremiah 31, 33, God said about the new covenant under Christ, I'll put my law in their hearts and in their minds. And He has done that in the gospel. Verse 12, we praise God, we petition Him. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Praise and petition and prayer is always proper for the Christian. And it goes right along with study. Uh, The more God teaches us, the more we will want. I believe that. I've seen that operative in my own life, and I'm not saying it to brag, I'm just stating it as fact. Uh, To prove that to you in this very psalm itself, and we'll repeat this theme as you notice, verse 12, 26, 33, 64, 66, 68, 108, 124, 135, that same petition is made again and again, over and over, teach me, O Lord, because he knew the more he understood about God, the more excited he was to learn still more. And uh, people that don't study God's Word don't understand that. 
I've had family members tell me, and I've been in their presence, and it was just something I, I know I should have maybe been present with them. And I'm not talking about Amy and the boys. I'm talking about other places. And I've had them tell me, will you please put up your Bible and just visit with me or do this? And I said, I, I'm, I'm I own something. I'm like a dog on the trail. I, I've got to study this. This is exciting. And I've had a few of them tell me, you study too much. Well, the more you know, the more you'll want to know. And that's a wonderful thing indeed. Verse 13, the word in your heart and mind is the fuel for evangelism. We're talking a lot about that topic, aren't we? How does that happen? With my lips, I've declared all the judgments of your praise. When I know what God has done for me, I want to tell others. Sinful silence, most are guilty and I am too. And I hate the times that I wish I should have said something and I didn't. This past Monday, I stood here. We honored Sister Rosemary. Tomorrow, I'll stand in Jackson County and try to pay some honor to one of my classmates, 42 years old, just like I am, uh, died of COVID and other complications. Sinful silence. I wish I would have said more to him in those years when we were in school together. I have no hope for his eternity like I did for hers. That's a big difference, isn't it? And uh, that's tough. Acts 4, verse 20, Jeremiah 20, verse 7 and 9, we have to speak, we have to teach, we have to preach God's word. Jeremiah said, if you recall, he said, I wanted to be quiet, but your word was like a burning fire in my bones. I had to let it out. And so that's what the psalmist is expressing here uh, in these beautiful terms. Verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. You know, we talk about what brings us joy. If you doubt that, you know, just ask a grandparent. They'll show you in picture form what brings them joy. You see, I was preparing this lesson earlier in the week. I was prepared to wear my nice orange tie because I was going to say the Wildcats, you know, we put a hurting on them yesterday. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, the UT basketball team went up to Lexington and just got manhandled. So that doesn't bring me any joy this morning, but it shouldn't even if the other team would have won and my tie color was different. Not as much joy as should the Word of God bring me in my life. God's way of living is more precious. I've rejoiced in the way of your testimony as much as in all riches. What would bring you greater joy? Uh, to see growth and development and sanctification and holiness or just a raise? Or the opportunity to live in a nicer neighborhood or to drive a more expensive car or to take a nicer vacation? You see, those are the things too often we allow to dominate our perspective. But God's way of living should be more precious than all of that. Jeremiah 6.16, Jeremiah said, look for the old way, the old paths. Walk in that way because that's where the good way is. That's the way that will bring you true joy and happiness. Ephesians 3 and verse 8, uh, Paul is talking about the mystery of the gospel is that through God, through Christ, through the church, uh, the riches, the unsearchable riches of Christ are made known. What a wonderful way to describe what God has done for us. Unsearchable riches, and we're thankful for them. Verse 15, how do we take notice of these things? He said he would meditate. I will meditate on your precepts, contemplate your ways. Uh, meditation is a, is a broad word. It involves a lot, and uh, time would fail us to really uh, consider every idea related to it. But I think in a nutshell, to meditate, you say, well, how do I meditate on God's word? You have a habitual awareness. You have a continual recalling. Uh, and you've been around people like that, and I have too. And I didn't understand it when I was younger, but now that I'm getting older, I begin to understand it. Maybe some of you uh, do too. Something happens, and they'll just tie in what happened with something that the Bible talks about. Well, you know, the Bible says, and they'll mention that. That's what meditation's about. So uh, if there's some situation in life that I'm not sure, uh, I may not be able to recall the exact chapter and verse, but I need to think, well, does the Bible say anything about that? If I'm worried or fearful, well, does the Bible say anything about that? Well, yeah, Jesus said, don't worry about your life. So meditate on the precepts, on the Word of God. It's a prescription for a healthy mental state. I know when um, I'm not minimizing that there is a thing, there is something called mental illness. There is physiologically within uh, the brain of certain people, uh, deficiencies and imbalances that cause and manifest itself in illness. That, that's a fact. That's a scientific fact. And it should not be ignored. If you have diabetes, uh, that's a physical condition. Uh, there are people that likewise uh, have chemicals that in their mind have been uh, unbalanced or altered to such a degree that medication and treatment is necessary. 
At the same time, there are many people who, however, without an awareness of God's Word, or even those who do have an awareness of His Word, who don't contemplate that, who do not dwell on that, who allow all the stresses and worries of life to overpower them. So this is a prescription for a healthy mental state, contemplating the ways of God, remembering what He's done, what He will do, how He's done that for us. Uh, Jeremiah 15, 16, he talks about God's Word. He said, I found your Word and I ate it. It was sweet to my soul. Uh, Job 23, 11 to 12, Job talks about the same. God's Word is so important that I ingest it, as it were, and I eat it, I feed on it. And uh, that's something we can all uh, do in an even better way. And then finally this morning, verse 16, he said, I will delight. I will delight. We've met that idea already. Myself and your statutes, I will not forget your wor uh, word. How much excitement does God's word bring you? Uh, you've heard me say it, and none of you have been bold enough because I don't think it applies to any of you. Some people have told me, Preacher, all of that Bible stuff's too boring for me. You've not really considered it. You've not really uh, studied it. You've not dug into it. Uh, the Bible is not boring. God's Word is not boring even a little bit. So how much does it bring you? Uh, spiritual amnesia is really the malady that he's talking about. Notice, I will not forget your Word. Too many have. Uh, Peter warns us in his epistles in the New Testament, some forget that they have been cleansed from their former way of living or from their old sins. And that's a terrible thing, especially for the Christian. They have forgotten what God has done for them. Notice verse 13 and 14, he said, I have and I have. And then verse 15 and 16, he says, I will. So there are some things that I have done. And because of that, then these are things that I will do, both past and present and future, all wrapped up into one. If you compare with verse 8, what he says in verse 16, uh, he sees uh, this beautiful development. He asks God in verse 8, do not forsake me utterly. And then he says to God in verse 16, I will not forget your word. In other words, I know I can ask you not to forsake me and I'm assured that you will not because I know that your word is true. How can a young person, how can, if you want to describe yourself as an old person, how can any of us live a clean life? There's only one way to do it and that's by putting God's word in our lives and doing that each day by our study of it. That's why Psalm 119 is a gold mine. That's why uh, we can dig into it. That's why we can find its treasures by turning to it and reading it uh, frequently. Uh, do you have a question or a comment, something you would like to add to the study this morning? Uh, as always, there's a lot of information, but uh, hopefully uh, you can take that and build on it in your own study, and it will bless um, your life. Next week, verses 17 to 24, uh, the Hebrew word gimel or the Hebrew letter at Gimel. We'll tell you what that means uh, at that point, but between now and then, at least once, that's what we're asking, and I've told you before, I think it would be great if you could do it at least every day. Uh, I've tried, I've, I might have skipped a day or two, but uh, what I've tried to be doing in my uh, habit study form for this class is read them, uh, these eight verses, uh, one of the first things in the morning, and then right before we go to bed at night. You can read it and 30 seconds, no more than a couple of minutes, even if you read very slowly. And uh, just let that be one of the first things you start your day thinking about, one of the last things that you go to bed thinking about. And God will bless you for that. So next week, the Lord willing, verses 17 to 24, we'll study that from Psalm 119, the goldmine of the Old Testament. Thank you for your good attention in studying with us this morning.